Good evening, good day, and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Berit Ebert. I'm Vice President of Programs here at the American Academy, and I welcome you all uh, to tonight's reading <laughs> A Violet Woman, A Novel in Progress um, by Ayana Mattis, who is our current Mary Ellen van der Heijn Fellow of this very semester, Fall 2020. The Mary Ellen van der Heijn Fellowship in Fiction was established in 2007 with the purpose of bringing outstanding novelists and fiction writers to the American Academy in Berlin. The fellowship recognizes Mary Ellen van der Heijn's lifelong passion for fiction, and Mary Ellen van der Heijn's husband, Carl, is a native Berliner and also founding trustee of the American Academy in Berlin. He served as its treasurer for more than a decade. He was the Academy's co-chairman from 2009 until 2011. But more important than that, um, Carl and Mary Ellen are with us tonight. Um, they are dialing in, listening in, zooming in from the United States. So this is a truly transatlantic event. Hi, Carl and Mary Ellen. Now I come to Ayana Mattis, who holds their fellowship. Ayana received her MFA at Iowa's Writer, Writers' Workshop where she subsequently became the first African-American woman to hold the position of assistant professor of English and creative writing. In an interview, Ayana spoke about her experience and about her expectations um, of the Iowa Writers' Workshop. And she said, I quote, I had this idea that to be a good writer, you wrote these pretty sentences. The biggest thing I learned in Iowa was that being a good writer has everything to do with telling the truth about what it means to be a human being. What it means to be a human being. At the American Academy, we often say that our mission has never been more important than now or is now more, more important than ever. Um, this is equally true about Ayana's definition of a writer and a good writer. Ayana, you are not just a good one, you are an excellent one, and most of all, a wonderful human being. I had the pleasure to experience that in many of our calls. But of course, there is more than calls to that, and there is real proof of Ayana being an excellent writer and a wonderful human being. I shall start. Ayana has taught at the MFA writing programs at Columbia University and Rutgers University at Newark. And now stay put, Ayana's first novel, The Twelve Tribes of Hattie, published in 2012, was a New York Times bestseller, a 2013 New York Times notable book, NPR best book of 2013, and second selection for Oprah's Book Club 2.0. It was also long listed for the Dublin Literary Award and nominated for the Hurston Wright Foundation's Legacy Award. Ayana's writing have, writings have pretty much appeared everywhere. Um, I shall read you a selection. Um, the New Yorker, The New York Times, Financial Times, Glamour, and Guernica. And her writing has been supported by the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, Civitella Ranieri Foundation, and the Bogliasco Foundation. This evening, Ayana will read from her novel In Progress, A Violent Woman, which is the story of Duchess and Lena Carson, an estranged mother and her daughter. Ayana wrote that it is a story about disruptive women and about free women. We all look forward to hearing more about that and about your work and about you. Um, however, before we start, I shall explain a little bit about our Zoom, et Zoom etiquette of tonight. Um, the first point is you are not allowed or you won't be able to use the raise your hand question but we encourage you highly uh, to ask questions. Um, this, there is a Q&A function, please use it. You can type in your questions. And after Ayana's reading, we will deal with them. Um, it is now my great pleasure to hand over to Ayana, who's joining us from upstate New York. The award-winning novelist, Marilyn Robinson, once said about Ayana that she is, and I quote again, a kind of a force of nature in a thoughtful and elegant way. Marilyn Robinson was absolutely right. And I'm glad that all of you will now get to know the force of nature. Ayana, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. And I, don't even, I didn't know that Marilyn ever said that. So now I'm, I'm a little bit teary. Um, so in any case, but before I start, um, I just wanted to thank, of course, to thank the Berlin Academy for this astounding fellowship and especially um, for making everything work and being so nimble and so gracious in this very strange pandemic period in which they're trying to conduct a residential fellowship uh, when physical residence is impossible. 
Um, and they've been so gracious and so wonderful at, at problem solving. So I just want to thank very much thank Barrett to the whole team there, um, to John, who's their technical expertise, um, who's kind of making all of this work. Um, I wanted to also thank uh, the generous donors who make the Academy possible, and especially to, uh, as Barrett just recently mentioned, to Mary Ellen and Carl van der Hayden, who um, have endowed this fellowship that I am enjoying this year. Um, and last but not least, I just want to thank all of you whom I can't see, so it's sort of weird because I'm talking to avoid, but I guess that's the Zoom thing. Um, but I wanted to just thank all of you whom I can't see who uh, made time to be here this evening and this afternoon, uh, evening for those of you who are in Europe, um, um, in this, despite extraordinarily busy lives and uh, real intense Zoom fatigue, which I know we are all kind of suffering from a little bit. Um, so my great thanks. Without further ado, I will just start right in. Um, I'll explain a little bit what I intend to do this evening um, is to read small sections of the novel that are interspersed with bits of commentary. And those bits of commentary will essentially be about themes or about things that are important to me about this novel. As Barrett mentioned, the novel uh, is in very much in progress. It is entitled A Violent Woman. She already gave you a very deep brief description, so I won't, um, I won't belabor that very much. I will only add that, uh, again, it is a story of a mother and daughter who are estranged. The mother, whose name is Duchess Carson, lives in a town, in a fictional town, in Alabama that is called Bonaparte. And it was a, its past is very important. It was a, a kind of a once thriving all black settlement that was, um, that came into existence toward the end of the 19th century and is now sort of in its death throes. Uh, it's, it's slowly, it's the land that it holds and, um, and the population there are, are slowly diminishing. Um, and so we, one of the questions in the novel is whether or not Bonaparte will survive the modern era. Um, and then Lena, Duchess's daughter, left Bonaparte when she was just a teenager, basically, uh, the end of her teens, and she ends up settling in Philadelphia. And when she's there, she, uh, she has a son named uh, Toussaint, and she's, you know, Lena is, is a woman that's looking for something, and she doesn't really ever seem to find it, and she doesn't even really seem to know where it what it is she's searching for. But whatever this search is, leads her to a life that is fairly pillar to post. You know, she switches jobs a lot, she switches apartments, etc. She has, as I just mentioned, she has a son. His name is Toussaint. When the novel opens, Lena is in her early 40s and Toussaint is 10 years old. Um, they have been kind of moving around a lot through the city and just kind of more or less barely keeping their heads above water. Um, and then that is until Lena in a kind of final last grasp for normalcy or civility um, makes a bad marriage and, and a, a doomed marriage effectively. And when that marriage ends, because she and Tucson have so few resources, they entered into this marriage with so few resources, when that marriage ends, Lena and Toussaint find themselves sort of utterly without resources at all. And they, uh, they land in a homeless shelter. And that is where the novel opens. I will speak a little bit about a few of the things and the things that I am interested in in this novel. And um, thematically, it, it has quite a few things going on. I, sometimes I ask myself if it, has, if it has perhaps too many things going on. But in, in any case, um, it's quite a lot. And I'll just go through a couple of these to give context to the reading that I'll do. One of the central ideas here is the notion of the failed mother. Um, and I put that very much in air quotes. Uh, both Lena and her mother, Duchess, are failed mothers, I think, by most conventional standards. Both women love their children fiercely, but are unable, for various reasons, to subjugate their own drives and desires to the demands of motherhood as modern sensibilities narrowly characterize it. The novel, secondly, is also quite interested in mental illness. Um, Duchess, the, the Lena's mother in this novel is suffering from a, a very purposely unnamed mental illness. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in mental illness and I'm interested in how its effects might ripple through generations. I wanted to explore specifically, however, how those mental illnesses are 
and how they are experienced both by the person who is ill and by the people who love them. Um, and I, I wanted to, ex to explore the experiential nature of mental illness as opposed to how mental illness is pathologized. And, and I think that those are two very different things and, are, 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 and that's a crucial distinction to me. The novel further explores the policing of blackness and of black people, both in the literal sense and all in terms of how black lives are monitored, scrutinized, controlled and patrolled from the neighborhoods in which we are allowed to live, land we might own, how we speak, look, move through the world to, as we've seen in the most recent political election, how we vote. Finally, and vastly, this is a novel about the lives on the margins of conventional society. People, Black women in particular in this novel, make unconventional choices about how to live, where to live, and what to value. What joy and transcendence do these choices bring? And conversely, what do choices like that cost? I'm going to begin reading with a prologue, and then I'm going to read on into the opening pages of chapter one of the novel proper. I should say here that I, I continue to grapple with the prologue for reasons um, that largely, as you will see, because within the prologue is the novel's end. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit about why that's the case. I think, do think, and have been thinking a great deal about the metaphysics of time. And I think a lot about how novelists manipulate time. It's one of the things that I teach about actually quite frequently. Um, so one of the things that I've tried to do in this novel is to create a feeling of cyclical time. It's to say that in this book, time tends to loop around on itself. Or per perhaps it's more accurate to say that the future contains elements of the past and present that precede it. I suppose another way of saying it still is that this novel believes in ghosts. So without further ado, I'm gonna read the first section that I'm going to read. It'll probably be the longest part that I read. Uh, the novel is in two parts. Um, part one is mostly what I'll be reading from today. So without further ado, A Violent Woman, the prologue. In Philadelphia on Mother's Day, 1985, fire consumed the 60 houses on Fryeme Avenue where Toussaint Carson lived. Nothing survived the flames. Not Toussaint's mother or his father or anyone he loved. A few girders remained after the fire and an old oak in the middle of its trunk. After the fire, the city grieved, but not for Toussaint or his parents. Churches and civic groups and the mayor himself cried, rebuild, and Ephraim Avenue was rebuilt so the people could move on. The residents, all except the ones in house number 248 where Toussaint lived, returned to the block with the bits of furniture they'd managed to buy with the insurance money and the payout from the city. All of their precious things had been destroyed birth certificates and babies inked handed hand prints and the oldest child's high school diplomas. Ghosts haunted the newly built houses. Somewhere, some Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Jefferson might be in the middle of a perfectly normal afternoon when in an instant time knitted itself into some old shape and that Mrs. Jones or Jefferson would see clear as day, Mr. So-and-so, that one who lived in the middle of the block, used to wash his car on Sundays, standing on the bottom step, polishing his sunglasses, the shirt tails. Or she might see that young dreadlocked boy that lived in the middle house. What was it? Number 248, the one with those people had, who had brought the calamity down on Ephraim Avenue. That boy with the name she couldn't pronounce, always running with a band of other kids selling tomatoes from a shopping cart. Mrs. Jones might weep at that memory while all along Ephraim, the newly plastered walls of the reed houses cracked, bathroom floors warped, then buckled. Leaky roofs caused ceilings to cave in the middle of the night, rainwater poured in. The residents left Ephraim family by family, never to return. Grass pushed through the cracks in the sidewalk. Mushrooms grew in the basements. Crackheads and junkies and the most dedicated of career drunks took over the houses on either side of number 248. 
but the ghost of the fire had their sights on them. In the midst of their mad dog dreams, flames lapped at their backs and they woke up burning in the cold abandoned rooms of Ephraim. Before long, they too were run off and the abandoned block was hush. One evening, many years later, Toussaint stepped into, onto Ephraim Avenue with a backpack slung over his shoulder and a bleeding cut on his cheek. He was 14 years old. He had had many homes after the fire, group homes and foster homes, homes for wayward boys, but he always busted them. Ain't no grave can hold my body down, went the lyrics of one of the songs he knew. He stood a long time on Ephraim, watching the brown leaves falling from the charred oak. The gutter pipe on 248 came loose and bent with a metallic shriek that sent the starlings in the oak flying off into night. Toussaint had not eaten in two days. His legs were unsteady beneath him and his head buzzed. He had run most of the way to Ephraim, stopping to catch his breath behind parked cars or alleys. His heartbeat was too fast, as though his blood were too thin and running through him like water. He touched his hand to the cut on his cheek and felt something small and hard protruding, a shard of glass. Earlier that day, in another part of the city, some boys who hung around the same corner Toussaint had been hanging around asked him a couple of questions. Why are you always alone? And why you don't ever say nothing? You ain't got no parents? Answers to these questions were unbearable. Sometimes grief came on Toussaint like a sweeping numbness up from his toes and along his neck so he couldn't swallow. Other times, it was a column of rage rising along his spine. In answer to the boy's questions about his mother, he had picked up a brick. He picked up a brick and threw it through the glass window of an abandoned storefront on the corner. Then he ran, ran to Ephraim. On Ephraim Avenue, he stomped his feet to warm himself. His sneakers thudded against the asphalt and the sound rang in the cold, empty air, so he stomped harder. And the thing with being alone is you can't tell if you're still there or not. He called, yo, 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 just to hear his own voice echo down the block. Ephraim was covered in shadow, as though the night was more night there than elsewhere. He bashed in the plywood nailed over the door of house number 248. He had used the last of his strength. The cut on his cheek began to bleed again. Blood trickled down, or perhaps it was tears. He ducked in through the hole he would made in the plywood and entered the house. He settled in the warmest corner with a blanket, the bottle of old Tom he'd taken off of a sleeping drunk and a sheath of letters from his grandmother to his mother. Dear Lena, they began, or sometimes just girl. Letters to him too. His grandmother's name was Duchess. She lived in a place called Bonaparte. He was going there one day soon. Toussaint fell into a jerky, shivering sleep and dreamed of throwing the brick through that window all over again. Only this time, his mother somehow was there watching him. Baby, stop, she shouted over the sound of the glass shattering. Filaments of glass caught in the streetlight as they fell. The glass rain sparkled like tinsel. Now I'm going to move on into the novel proper. The first chapter of the novel proper is set in Philadelphia and it is set in 1984. So as you can see, the novel itself uh, precedes the prologue. So the events in the prologue happen after the novel proper. This first part is just simply titled Lena. Um, I'll recall for you that last sentence so that for continuity, uh, last sentence of the prologue is filaments of glass caught in the streetlight as they fell, the glass rain sparkled like tinsel, Lena. It tinseled down on Lena Carson, clutching her two suitcases in front of the Cherry, Cheek, Cherry Street Intake Center for the homeless. Lena cried out and dropped the bags. The latches unlatched where they hit the pavement, pavement and the suitcases burst open and popped their guts like a melon thrown from a great height. Visions are not real, 
or at least they aren't real yet, but they sure do terrify. Toussaint, Lena called out. He was standing right behind her, just as he had been before the vision, a little boy of 10, small for his age, with both hands around the handle of his own suitcase. There they were, mother and son, with three suitcases between them and a black trash bag bulging with their belongings. What were you doing on that street? Why did you? Lena paused. She was shrieking, she realized. No, never mind, she said. Nothing. She had never even heard of Ephraim Avenue. Hallucinations. This is the sort of thing that happens when you haven't slept for days and you're so exhausted that your vision goes black at the sides where the peripheral ought to be. Lena dropped to her knees and scrabbled at the things on the ground that had fallen open from the suitcase, pajamas, and her silk toch with a tie at the collar, and the one nice skirt she had managed to pack, Toussaint's good Buster Brown school shoes and his sequined Michael Jackson glove. She stuffed them back into the suitcase as fast as she could, only they wouldn't fit like they had before. Ma, you gotta fold them. Ma, they're just falling out again. Toussaint said. Brisk feet stepped around them. A pair of scuffed black lace-up shoes stocks to one of the suitcases. A woman's head lowered into view. You need some help, miss, she said. Lena shook her head. Let me help you. The woman's hands swung down and hovered over Lena's things. Cracked palm, ashy hands with dirt under the nails. No, no, Lena said. I mean, um, I mean, that's okay. Ugh, the woman said. Her heel went down on a pair of slacks as she walked away. Inside, Cherry Street reeked of sweat and stale junk food and hair. The waiting room was big like the DMV, with rows of plastic chairs bolted to the floor. The man at intake kept calling Lena and Toussaint up to the window to ask a single question. Names, okay, sit down. ID, okay, take a seat. It was grim, but it was busy. The people working there had an urgency about them, like they were fixing things with their phones pressed to their ears and their desks piled high with folders. In the corner of the waiting room, a skinny lady wrapped, rubbed Vaseline on her kid's elbows as if her life depended on it. That was a comforting sight. Lena nearly smiled. One monkey don't stop no show, as the saying goes. She squeezed Toussaint's hand. Maybe we won't have to wait too long, she said. But they did wait. An hour passed, then two, then afternoon came, or at least Lena guessed it was afternoon because the sun turned white and the room was broiling. The intake man called them up again to give Lena a stack of forms attached to a clipboard. When they returned to their seat, a, a go ahead and say something kind of woman was sitting there next to it with his arm deep in a bag of Doritos not a free chair left in the place. There wasn't anywhere to be, but leaned up against the wall. The thick air pressed on Lena's chest and stomach till she heaved a gob of sick into a wadded, tish, a, wadded a wad of tissue she picked up from the floor. A woman sitting at the edge of a nearby row frowned and looked away. Good Lord, Lena thought. Who's going to help us if there's nobody here but these women and their kids, every single one of them poor as a crack in the floor? People with nothing can't do nothing, like Lena's mother used to say. Ma, Toussaint asked, you want me to hold it? Lena couldn't balance the clipboard against the wall and keep the papers from slipping to the floor. Her boy put his hand on her arm. His eyes were big as plums and flitted from one thing to the next from a nut brown baby slung over a shoulder to a little girl who kept undoing her barrettes till her mama popped her one, and a lady shaking her papers at the intake man. Lena swallowed back another wave of sick and focused on her forms. The forms had questions like last address, 245 Turnstone Pike, James Creek, New Jersey. This is where she'd lived with her ex-husband. Then they had questions like next of kid, not applicable. Marital status, married, emergency contact, not applicable. What circumstances led you to seek assistance at the Cherry Street Center for Homeless Services? Two weeks ago, Lena wrote, my husband threw us out our home, no, his home in New Jersey. Then she wrote, last night, 
me and Toussaint were sitting in a bus shelter across the street from a lady's house way out in the Northeast. She had a beautiful kitchen. She put a pitcher of iced tea on her table. We could see in through her windows. It was dark in the bus shelter where we were, but then the street light came on over us and we were all lit up. That woman in her kitchen saw us, so I didn't think we should stay there, but we were so tired. I spent the last of the money on a motel. In the morning, my son asked where'd we go after we left that motel. Are we gonna spend the night here again, is what he said. I got him an egg sandwich at the McDonald's down the street. We sat in the air conditioning and watched some kids on the slide at the playland. Then we came here on the L. Lena ran out of space on the forms and had to write down through the margins. She knew that this wasn't the kind of answer those people wanted, but it was just that she had to tell somebody. The man at the intake window was talking on the phone and he didn't even look up when Lena pushed the clipboard through the slot. She stood with her arms at her sides and waited. After some time, he glanced up at her and sighed. All right, miss, come on, take it easy. He took the clipboard. Miss, you can't cry in here. You need to calm down, Gloria. You need to come out here because this lady is, miss, don't put your hands all up on the glass. Gloria was noisy coming out of a side door. Okay, okay, she said to Lena. You got to be easy or we can't. But it wasn't just Lena. Half of the people in there were crying or trying not to. Wouldn't any of them look each other in the eye though? I'll stop there. Um, I'm gonna move on. Excuse me, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens next and then I'll move on to the next section that I wanted to share with you this evening. So um, essentially Lena and Toussaint after this uh, experience in this intake center are assigned to a family shelter um, called the Glen Avenue Family Shelter. And they go on to live there for the next four months. So the novel follows them as they settle in there um, and, and sort of what happens to them while they're there. Lena becomes increasingly um, obsessed with how she and her son came to be in this situation. And she comes to feel as though she might be able to write things somehow if she could only understand exactly where they had gone wrong. So she begins to chronicle in diaries and in letters that she does not send to her estranged mother, Duchess. She begins to chronicle the details of she and Toussaint's life before they got to the Glen Avenue shelter. Um, and that includes uh, talking about her failed marriage. In this process, she, uh, she becomes increasingly withdrawn. And uh, this is very difficult, as you can imagine, for Toussaint, who is only 10 at this time, and he very much needs his mother and her support and her comfort. Uh, but instead, she's kind of increasingly wan and, and remote and, and hard to reach. So here's a, a very brief section that I'm going to read from the novel. Um, and this is, this is kind of describes a little bit how Toussaint is experiencing this increasing isolation and uh, feeling of distance from his mother. Uh, just a little bit of context. They're at the Glen Avenue shelter, they're in their room and um, it's Labor Day, it's the Labor Day holiday, uh, which means there are barbecues and all that kind of thing. And at Glen Avenue at the shelter, they also celebrate something they call, fam they call family day on Labor Day. And so the shelter is open to visitors and all kinds of other people um, and they barbecue and they play music and all of this kind of stuff. Lena, however, um, doesn't want Toussaint to go out and join these celebrations. She doesn't want, she feels uh, quite upset about the fact that they're there and she is also wants to keep her son away from these people as she feels that they might be a bad influence. So he wants to go out, but she won't let him. This section is, uh, is still in the third person, but very much from Toussaint's perspective. The hot dog hamburger smell hung in the air. Earth, wind, and fire played on the radio in the playground. Boogie on down, down, boogie on down. Toussaint mouthed along to the song. Then just like that, then just like that, he memoried himself all the way back to New Jersey. That's where he had lived uh, right before they came to the shelter. Then just like that, he memoried himself all the way back to New Jersey. He could smell the taste, he could taste the gumbo at his friend Paul's house 
and the milk he drank after, silky, creamy, and cooling his mouth. Paul's mother always had the stove going. There was always a pot of something bubbling over and dripping down the sides. Call me Jilly, she said the first time they met. No miss, just Jilly. Jilly knew every card game there was. You don't know how to play nothing? Not even gin rummy, she'd asked him that first time. They're holy rollers, his friend Paul explained by way of explanation. He didn't mean anything by it. Paul had never even been to church himself, not one time. He asked if he could come with Toussaint some Sunday, just so he could see what it was like. Jilly taught Toussaint to play blackjack. Oof, hopefully Jesus won't get mad, she said and winked. She was always laughing, and it sounded just like the telephone ringing, bells, 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 and she was always in a slip when he and Paul got there after school. She smelled like sweet candy, like if you could make candy out of flowers. She had her hair in curlers and walked back and forth, stirring the kitchen pots and then back to changing the records in the living room over and over again with the mascara wand in her hand. At some point, in the late afternoon, she'd put on a dress and heels and click clack out the door. See you tomorrow, babies, she called on her way out. Jilly was just like a movie, just like a whole movie star. And then she was gone and Paul took control of the turntable. He and Paul had the whole world to themselves then. You know Sylvester? Paul would ask, you know Martha Wash? He was three years older than Toussaint. He gave him an education. They played songs 10 times, 15 times, till they knew every single word, every break in the beat. The house still smelled of Jilly's cooking and her perfume. The sun cut the living room into gold and shadow and the music thumped in the floors. Family day was loud as if it was happening right there in their room at the shelter. Toussaint, the memory behind him now, wondered if maybe people were dancing out in the playground. And glide like a 747 and Lou sang under his breath. Lena returned then from a walk she'd taken around the Glen Avenue shelter and she sat herself down at the desk with one of the notebooks they got from the back to school van, one of his notebooks. What are you gonna do with that? Tucson asked. Oof, these gnats, Lena said waving her hand around. There were only gnats because Lena hadn't eaten the banana Toussaint had brought for her that morning. Honey, she said, close that window. It's just letting the bugs in. But, Toussaint said, Lena didn't reply. She had opened the notebook and was flipping through like she'd already written something in it but couldn't find what page it was on. She was in one of her moods, Toussaint could see. She was like a big tall mountain with clouds so thick around it you couldn't see the top half. It was very cold up there behind those clouds, on a real mountain that is, which Toussaint knew from geography class. On a real mountain, if you tried to climb, you'd have felt like you were the only person left on earth. You'd have felt so lonely you could die. And I'll stop there. So um, Toussaint's relationship with his mom grows increasingly strained and a kind of silence settles between them, which is quite tragic, of course, given the circumstance they, they're in and, and they need each other so much. Um, but it's also a, a stark contrast to the way, at, to their relationship before this, where they'd always sort of been co-conspirators. You know, they were, their lives were, were messy, but they, there was always this sense that they were in it together and that begins to fade. Toussaint, um, sort of bereft and bewildered, begins skipping school and he sort of wanders around the city streets during the day instead of going to school um, and, and becomes something of an itinerant, um, a little bit uh, like his retired blues singing grandmother Duchess was before him, though he knows very little of her background. So this uh, brings me to the next section that I would like to read. Um, I should say also that um, structurally the novel kind of moves back and forth between Philadelphia, those are the, the sections I've just read are set in Philadelphia, and Bonaparte, where Duchess lives. The connection between those places, in addition to the fact, of course, that mother and daughter live in them, is um, implicit rather than explicit. That is to say that these places are connected to one another on the level of history. 
Bonaparte is a kind of wondrous Southern homeland, suddenly, uh, slowly, I'm sorry, being lost to time, lost to the migration away, mostly north of its inhabitants and lost to land theft. Additionally, um, with regard to the relationship between these two places, Philadelphia and Bonaparte, um, images and events recur or are gestured, gestured toward in each place so that Philadelphia echoes Bonaparte and vice versa. Bonaparte was originally modeled on an actually extant small town in Alabama called Gee's Bend, which some of you may be familiar with for its very famous quilts. Um, and Gee's Bend is certainly an influence geographically, definitely, on the way I envisioned Bonaparte. Um, but as I began to write, Bonaparte took on a different kind of character on the page. Um, it sort of became slightly supernatural and a little bit magical uh, and certainly mythological um, to some extent. I mentioned earlier um, in my, my opening comments that I was very interested in the metaphysics of time and how I might manipulate time to create a fluid and circular experience of time rather than a more rigid and linear sense of time. I'm very interested in the ways also that literature might lift an event or a place entirely out of time, sort of pluck it out of time so that it feels large and enduring and effectively timeless. That sort of feeling is the stuff of myths and tales and sacred texts. Um, so that's a lot of what I'm playing around with um, in trying to create this place called Bonaparte. So I'm gonna read to you now the opening strains of the first section that takes place in Bonaparte in this novel. All the Bonaparte sections, this one included, are narrated by Duchess. So what you're going to hear now is a, is a kind of an origin myth, if you will. In the beginning was the Alabama River. Sunrise, dusk, starling flight. Gators, sunfish, Spanish moss, live oak, mountain lion, lark. Muscogee, Choctaw, Chickasaw. Bonaparte wasn't yet Bonaparte because all the niggers were still in Africa, not knowing they was gonna become niggers. Wasn't no Huntress or Isabella full of Africans sold with told to Quakers. No ship called Clotilda sunk off the coast of Mobile. All the white folks was still up in their cold palaces, sharpening their swords, fighting each other. They sure was coming though. And when they did, they wanted to conquer death and time. They came down on the world like the rain came down on Noah. They wanted to be the rain and Noah and God too. All this time, they still ain't figured out that God helps people invent the God they deserve. So white folks have Zeus, popes, dollars, big motherfuckers that suck the bones of tender things, scared all the real gods into hiding with their cannon fire, burning forests, wailing women, whales trailing blood under all the oceans, death howling everywhere at once, big old teeth chomping up all the Indians, every wood and every plain, their ships filthying the waters with all our mothers sealed below the decks. Above the decks, the sails clapped and the wind blew the crew's hair and whipped their lice into the foaming water. Their souls went in after. Damnation goes down their ghosted generations. Every day, they are more brown, less ghost, more us, less them. They know it, do not worry. In the meantime, sing. Do not die for as long as you can help it. Grease up your skin so it glistens hard. Make brownness or watch over it, either or both. Bonaparte is how the white people called this place on the banks of the Alabama River. It was green and greener, even after they got some bodies to fell the trees. Some bodies planted cotton, planted sorghum, more cotton. Them motherfuckers didn't know what they was doing. Could have asked the Chickasaw, but they drove them like dogs to Oklahoma. Could have asked the niggers, but you know. The earth turned on them, told you they was cursed, and sent plagues of insects. We had our kitchen gardens. We had our chitlins and pig feet. We know how to eat around little bones. Floods came, God said float. Niggers made rafts out of wood. The first master drowned, washed up, covered with leeches. The second master, yellow fever, 
third master, tuberculosis. Fourth master's three sons all died on the same full moon night. Shit, them Chickasaw spirits don't play. Our mothers neither. Massa was so shook, he came down to the cabins, his thing soft as moss and in his pants for once. What happened to my sons, he wanted to know. Should have put blood on your door, old Reba said. He whipped her, sure, but three weeks later, he was dead too. Heartbreak, you reckon. After that, there was a lull in Masters. The story goes that old Reba took to standing on the river's edge, looking across the water. One day, every 10, every decade or so, she'd say, one's coming. Then she'd turn her back and walk into the woods and wouldn't nobody see her till that master grew a goiter on his throat and strangled or got burnt up in a cabin down in the woods. Then the war came and went and evidently we all got freed but nobody in Bonaparte heard about that till long after because by then wouldn't know white folks blight our shores or our woods or our fields. Bonaparte farmed. People made shiny eyed babies with minds sharp as traps. The old people taught the little ones to read and figure. Reba kept watch on the shore. One day, after who could say how many years had passed, one day Reba said, one's coming. White folks trooped up the road, looking around as though they never saw the like. The men would know yesa in their mouth and the women looking them all right in the eye. Fields neat as handkerchiefs, laid out after ironing and fat with cows. The white men say they got new plans for a new time. New time, says Bonaparte. 19 and 36, the white folks say. The plans say the government decided to give Bonaparte to the people, even though the people already had it. Reba said, sure, let them, but don't tell them nothing. So it went. The white people did their surveys and drew up their deeds. Everybody signed. When it was done, Bonaparte gathered by the river at dusk. Reba said, we got our God above in the clouds and in the falling rain and down below in the seed and in the veins in the leaves and in every drop in our river. Everything born on this land, she knows by name. Anything come for us, our God rise against it through us. We are her vengeance and her blessing. Then Reba, she sure was something old by then. She raised her arms up to the woods and up came a flock of starlings swelling the sky. They're still there every night, a wave surging black across the twilight. You ought to see them. Oh, you ought to. It's nobody left here now. Cows, graves, me. There's nothing but 1,000 acres of Bonaparte left between us. We are Carter Lee and his stupid wife, Juniata, and Memma and Nipla Prairie and Irma Linner. Bonaparte was, once upon a time, 10,000 acres, 10,000 free nigger acres. Hear that. The records are across the river in Bodine at the Pauline County Courthouse. All of us Carsons and Fenways and Moores and Bennies and Dukes and Jameses and Coopers, all our deeds and property surveys and tax records, alongside the records of the white folks' thievery, which they call bills of sales or sometimes foreclosure, depending on how they do the stealing. That's 9,000 acres lost, if you can stomach the count. Nobody left around here can stand to hear it, and you can't blame them. Irma Linner, she used to have 600 acres all on her own, but her no account crackhead sons sold them off piece by piece so they could suck it up a pipe, gamble dice, and then move to Washington, D.C where, if it's any justice at all in the universe, they are dead as alley cats. I do my best to keep up morale and get us to stick together, as you can see. But you know, you can lead a donkey right down to the water's edge, but the motherfucker still might kick you in the head. I'll stop now. So that's Duchess. Um, so um, we're gonna come now. She, she, she's a pretty powerful voice and she's, um, I feel very lucky to have found her because she just sort of uh, presented herself to me um, and, and has remained rather constant and unchanging uh, in ways that other parts of the novel have proven much more difficult. Duchess remains steady and sure of herself. Um, in any case, so we come now to the final piece, 
that I would like to share with you. Um, this that I'm about to read comes from the very end of part one. Um, and part one lays the stage, of course, for the second and final part of the novel. Um, so through various twists and turns in the first part of the novel, Lena finds herself in renewed relation with Cass, with a man named Cass, who is her ex-lover and who is Toussaint's father, and also becomes the charismatic, misanthropic leader who founds a group called STEP that Lena becomes a part of. Um, and what happens to Lena and to Step and to Cass and to Sant is uh, basically the, the second half of the novel. Um, and here I, I'm gonna pause to give you just a little note about Step, which is not an acronym, it's just called Step, all caps. Um, and it's modeled after, um, it's a fictional political black radical separatist group active, that is modeled after a real group uh, that existed and still exists in Philadelphia called MOVE. Um, MOVE uh, became active in the late 60s and 70s and as I said, still active to this day. Uh, MOVE is significant for many reasons. They were, they were sort of before their time. They were both um, radical and, and marvelous and useful and also kind of a, a pain in the butt. You know, they, they did things like compost. They would take over a house and, and create, create a compound out of it and they would live in there and sort of harass their neighbors. Um, but at the same time, they were very interested in, in what they saw as, a, as an impossible to attain, obtain black freedom. Um, they were vegetarians, they composted, as I said. Um, they were also pretty heavily armed. Um, and the reason for that is because they believed themselves to be, and in fact were, under fairly regular attack by the police, though they um, almost never instigated these kinds of confrontations with the police. So um, um, fast forwarding a little bit, um, there is a, a hor horrifying incident that happened in Philadelphia on May 12th in 1985. Um, Move was living uh, in a house on a street called Osage Avenue. And uh, the neighbors on Osage Avenue complained about them fairly frequently because I said, as I said, they were complicated people who were not always the easiest to live next to. Um, so the, the neighbors on Osage Avenue had been sort of complaining about them to the police, um, wanting the police to intervene in some way, shape or form. The police decided that what should happen was that they would um, is that move should be removed from this house that they live. And again, just to underscore this, I'm not talking about my fictional group, I'm talking about actual history, what happened to move. So the police decided that they should remove this group from this house uh, forcibly. So they evacuated the block, uh, Osage Avenue, which had about 60 homes on it. And the, the architecture in that neighborhood is row houses. So all the houses are connected to one another. So the police evacuated every house on the block, except for the move house. And an armed, a 12 hour, sorry, armed standoff ensued in which 10,000 rounds of ammunition were fired into the move house. Um, there were 11 people in the house at the time. Um, the, nothing like that number of ammunition was fired back. In fact, it was something like, I don't know, 50, 50 bullets or something like that. Um, in any case, this siege of the move house goes on and on and on um, and, and seems to show no real sign of breaking. And so the mayor of Philadelphia, alongside the police chief, decide that they need to do something to, to end this, this standoff. And so what they decided to do was to drop an explosive on the roof of the house. So a helicopter drove over, and this is in the middle of Philadelphia. Um, the, uh, a hel helicopter flew over the move house and it dropped a C4 explosive on, on top of, on the roof. And the entire block, as you can imagine, these being row houses went up in flames. The resulting explosion killed 11 people who were in the house, five of whom were children. So um, I have, borrowed in some ways from this really horrific incident. And uh, the book plays, um, pays homage to it, certainly. But I don't intend to present MOVE factually in my novel. And the novel is not about MOVE. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. So as I said, um, I'm move us forward quickly so that we have time for questions. As I said, in the second half of the novel, uh, Lena and Toussaint, along with several others, are living communally 
in a row house on a mythical street in Philadelphia that I have called Ephraim Avenue. Step ends quite tragically. It in fact ends just as Move did, um, that group, my fictional group, but it is not tragic. And what I mean by that is that one of the things that I hope to explore in part two is the joy and the joy that Lena finds and that other people find living with this group called Step. Um, they find a certain joy of of finding belonging, of living on their own terms, of finding at long last what it is that they're looking for. And these are experiences, it seems to me, that very few of us ever actually have, even if the joys that she finds are high risk in terms of things like safety and security. Cass and Lena too, as it turns out, as she learns about herself, are interested in freedom and freedom particularly back, black freedom in the American context is pretty costly. So I hope also that in the, the second part of the novel, that the sections that take place in the step house, um, I hope that those sections with step, despite its more sinister elements, I hope that these things will be a kind of mirror for the freedoms um, in and of Bonaparte that Lena enjoyed very early in her life before she left uh, and that her mother enjoyed too. So uh, last thing I'll say before I finish up with just reading a brief section is that um, I'm not going to read from part two at all. It is, um, I've been working on it. Um, it's the thing that I've been devoting the bulk of my energy to during my fellowship term just now. So that part two is very, very, very much in progress. And it feels yet uh, a bit too fragile to expose even to such a, a generous audience. Instead, I'm going to read from the last few pages of part one. Uh, this section is Lena's first sighting of Cass after not having seen him for a very long time. Um, they, they sort of lost track of each other. Um, and Cass has now sort of, is, is poised to form this group step. He has not formed it yet when we see him in the scene I'm going to read. Um, but what he's doing here is, is he's giving a kind of sermon um, um, along some railroad tracks um, to, to a group that has assembled in a kind of tent city. Lena ends up there because she has discovered that Toussaint, I mentioned earlier, he'd stopped going to school and Toussaint, um, you know, he's just sort of regularly truant at this point and, and makes friends with some folks who hang around in this encampment. And Lena has followed him there because she's trying to get to the bottom of his truancy. And there she, she discovers um, there she re-encounters Cass. Um, oh, I should say just context. He, um, what has happened before the, the sentences that I'm about to read is that Cass has sort of stepped out on a stage and everyone is transfixed, Lena included, because she certainly did not expect to see him. And as much as she is drawn to him, she's also sort of afraid of, of him and what he might mean. He's a, he's a very charismatic, powerful force. Um, so without further ado. Ma, Toussaint said. Lena wanted to continue up the slope and over the ridge. She didn't want to stand there looking at Cass with her heart in her throat and her legs frozen beneath her. Toussaint, she said, we have to go. Please, we can't sit here. Please, come on, let's go. It was as if he was the mama and she was the little girl. Toussaint pulled her gently toward his father. She took one halting step and then another. Cass was gilded in the lowering sun. His white shirt glowed. His hair shined amber. His voice shot like a missile across the little gulch and the ragtag assembly. First, he said, he's standing above the, on atop of a platform giving this sermon. First, weep. Me too. Weep for the beautiful ruined world. Look at that sun slashing orange into their glass towers in the distance. And look at those silver trains bulleting down the track. We built those, you know. We laid the tracks and plowed the fields and nursed their babies and still they do us this way. Weep because they made the rules and told us, told us there was no other reality but the one where they are the kingdom and we are the slaves. That's a lie. Weep for the lies. Weep for the death that they bring. Weep because they don't know that they can die. Let me tell you something. The kingdom wants eternal life. 
It wants everything to go on forever, just like it is right now. It doesn't want you to weep. Sorrowful people ask questions. Sorrowful people start looking to the past for answers. So the kingdom destroys history and enslaves the future. The kingdom, ladies and gentlemen, the kingdom, brothers and sisters, the kingdom is seamless. It's smooth as the glass on those towers so we can glide on it from nowhere to nowhere. The kingdom is a conveyor. The belt tightens round your arm and the vein pops plump and the needle goes in and we are swimming in the warm bliss, the sick numb of oblivion. And while we are numb, while we are in our poison dream, the kingdom opens its jaws and shovels us in like pig feet. Weep, brothers and sisters, weep and then dry your eyes, straighten your backs, overturn the money lending tables in the temples of the kingdom. I know y'all remember those old Sunday sermons, right? From when you were kids. You remember, you remember the prophet said, do not consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. And so Cass does in fact do a new thing. That ends my presentation. I wanna thank you all so much for listening and I hope that I have left enough time for questions and would be so happy to have them. What are your influences in using in the use of time? How do you think about time? Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Okay, um, this, is, this is a very difficult question and for me to answer with any kind of brevity, but I will try. I, I literally, I teach semester long seminar on time and time in fiction. So it's, it's hard for me to come Press. But I will, but I will try because it is a it is a thing that's very dear to my heart. Um, I would say that probably in terms of writers, my the two biggest influences that I know that um, th that I have in terms of how I think about time are Toni Morrison and William Faulkner, um, and they both of them sort of they have very different ways of using time in their work, but both of them I proceed from the notion that time is not linear. Um, the notion that it is impossible to consider a present or to understand what is happening in a present or to understand the weight of the present without understanding all of the things that have kind of come before it. Um, you know, Faulkner very famously said, um, you know, the past, is, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. Um, and so I, I sort of proceed from that idea that, that time is, um, that, that rather than being kind of a straight line moving forward that it is is more something like a river so that everything that ever was in that river all the sediment all of the rest of the stuff is sort of carried for is carried with it even as that river moves forward um in terms of of, of thinking about how to write about it um that is an ongoing i suspect lifelong <laughs> project i mean one one of the things that i'm trying to do here as i as i mentioned um, is you know is sort of embedding elements of different phases of time inside an extant phase. So I'll try to embed something of the future in a bit of the past, or I'll try to embed a bit of the past in something that is that is ostensibly about a future. Um, uh, what I'm one of the difficult things about that is control, <laughs> obviously, because if if you can't figure out how to control that, then what you have is a big gigantic mess that nobody can follow you through. Um, so I should mention here another in on time is, is uh, James Baldwin. Um, I, Sunny, the story Sonny's Blues comes to mind. Um, you know, James Baldwin does these sort of amazing things with time in that story, particularly with past and memory. That story is, is in many ways a story about the past, or in any case, it is a story in which um, the past is equally important as the present. Um, and you can't possibly understand anything about the present without understanding the past. So I, I think a lot about how those writers have used time in thinking about how I might use it. The other thing that I'm trying to do and to work on is, um, is to create a sense of, and this is difficult to articulate, um, I, I'm trying to sort of create a sense of time as, as I mentioned, as always sort of circular and loop back around on itself. And one of the ways that I am trying to do that is I, I mentioned very briefly in my talk is, is embedding things like images, gestures, um, sounds, events even, 
in sort of putting those things in different places and in different times that are not the same time, but so that they're speaking to each other in a sense. So that what is created is a slight sense of things being cyclical or repeating themselves, sort of going around over themselves over and over again. Um, it's, um, it, it's been difficult. I, I suspect it always will be, but, but, it's, but it's the ways that I've found to, to kind of think about how to manipulate time or to, to make manifest or, or I guess articulate um, what I understand the work of history to be um, and what I understand. Uh, and, and when I say history, I mean personal and writ large societally, this kind of looping cyclical nature of things. Um, I, I won't go further because if I do, I'll get deeply into some sort of weeds of nerddom. Uh, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the other question is um, that refers to your use of female freedom, male freedom. You, when you just ended your reading, you said that Cass is powerful, Cass is on his way to joy. Um, Lena seems to be rather skeptical. She has, um, she has uh, the heart in her throat. She has the frozen legs. So she seems to be uh, much more nervous. How, how does female freedom differ from male freedom? And, um, your, and related to that, your, no, um, your novel is set in, mainly in the 70s and in the 80s. Has something changed? Has anything changed? Um, okay, so I'll take I'll take the first part of the question and then try to get to the second part. Um, I think I think in terms of these characters in this novel, um, I think that Cass, referring to this this notion of male freedom and female freedom, I think that Cass is more on his way. I, I, I think that he does does certainly experience freedom, um, particularly in the second part of the novel. I think that he has sort of. Um, thrown something off of himself in terms of how he thinks about the world. A little bit of background about Cass is that Cass is a doctor. Um, and when, when Lena and Cass meet sort of off stage, you know, before the, the, any of these sections of the novel that I've read, they have a relationship for a couple of years. They have this kid. Um, Lena says to him, you know, I, I want to have a kid, but I don't have anything to do with it. And she sort of sends him away. And he, he, he really is kind of a misanthrope. He's not a nice guy. Um, and so he goes away, and um, and then he and then he comes back, obviously. So he, I think that he, and he, he was also very involved in groups like the Black Panthers, etc. He was a doctor, um, it, and would sort of run a free clinic for the Black Panthers and stuff like this. So, but he comes to find that th that the sort of quest of for for a black freedom in those channels is insufficient, and so he strikes out on his own. Um, but his motives are mixed. I think that in some ways his motives really are about control and controlling people. You know, he is something of a kind of a cult figure in, in a certain way. Um, so he has a freedom, but but he's also kind of always miserable, you know? Um, and, and he assumes a freedom, I think that he, um, th that he felt more entitled to as a man um, than Lena or her mother have felt entitled to as women. Um, Lena, on the other hand, I think perhaps a big difference, here's a, here's a good, uh, good way to answer the question. I think perhaps a big difference between these two characters, Cass and Lena, um, is that Cass always knew that he was looking for freedom. Lena didn't know what she was looking for. She just knew that she felt as though something what there was something missing. She said this kind of restlessness, this engine churning always inside of her that she's been trying to, 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 to use in some way. And she could never find how to use it or what it was or what it wanted. And so I think that what she latched onto is an image of freedom that she had in her childhood. I didn't read very much about Bonaparte, but, it's, but it, it was this sort of free black state um, very much. It's, I mean, it's a myth obviously in my novel. And, and that's how she lived when she was a child. And her stepfather, a man named Avo, was the sort of captain of that ship of Bonaparte. And when he died, he was murdered. When he died, um, Lena's life changed irrevocably. Um, and so I think in some part, she came to realize that she was looking for freedom. She didn't know. And I think that she also thinks that freedom to some extent or thought that freedom for some, to some extent 
would be embodied in this charismatic male figure. So, you know, so, so Cass becomes this sort of surrogate or an echo of Avo, her stepfather. Um, and, and of course, I think with regard to women and freedom, that the, the proposition of, she's got sort of three things that she has to step outside of in order to be free. The strictures of, of, of race, right? And the strictures of white supremacy, which would confine her. Um, and then on top of that, also the fact of being a woman. And on top of that, the fact of motherhood. I mentioned very early that this is a person who, who that I'm interested in failed mothers. Um, and some of those failures are perceived failures, are about the, 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 the motherhood has this very narrow definition. And so she ought to be this way and she ought to be that way and she ought to be the other thing. This is the case with her own mother, Duchess, as well. Um, and if she's not those things, she's failed. And in a system that is set up to accommodate only a narrow path or a narrow definition of a particular role, there's nothing to support you if you step outside of that or if you don't want it or if you just simply can't do it. So you fail. Um, and so, you know, so she's got these three things that she is kind of wrangling with. And the struggle with these three things that would keep her um, jailed in a certain way, the struggle with these things is so totalizing that in some ways she doesn't even always realize that she's in a struggle or what the struggle is with. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a probably one of the ways that I think about, um, the ways that I think about female freedom. Um, and also one of the ways that I think about rage. I mean, Lena is a pretty angry woman. The, the book is called A Violent Woman and the violent women of the title are Lena and her mother, Duchess, who I haven't talked about a lot and there's no time now. Um, my sound is okay. Is it okay? Sound okay? Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I won't go into Duchess and all of that, but I think that an element in female freedom is anger or rage. Um, and I think that one of the other ways in which women are not allowed to be free is that women are not allowed to be angry and women are not allowed to rage and women are not allowed to act on rage, men are. So here's another place where we find the distinction between Lena and Cass. Cass is a misanthropic bastard who's very angry at everybody. He's particularly angry at white people, but he's just angry at everyone in general. And he repeatedly is able to act on that rage. It, it, it turns him to his death. Nonetheless, there is a permission there that Lena doesn't have. Um, and so she and women like her and women like her, their, her mother find themselves increasingly marginalized and powerless in the larger society because they are freedom seeking in a society that denies them that. Um, and, and, and of course it comes to be quite costly for them. Um, do I think it's any different? That was the last part of the question. I, I, yes, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that I do. I mean, I think, um, I think it's, you know, my mother, for example, is 87. Do I think it's different from when my mother was my age? Absolutely. Do I think it's terribly different than it was in the 1980s? Sometimes I think that it is. And then I come to realize that I do live in this sort of like Northeastern big city bubble, you know? And that when I read outside of that bubble, visit outside of that bubble, talk outside of that bubble, I find a lot of women who are, um, Feel very much imprisoned, um, and and who find themselves um, grappling with the certain sets of behaviors and things like that that are expected of them. Sometimes to the extent, to such an extent that they are are unable to even identify what those strictures are that are around them. You know, um, you know, it's like um, like it's so weird to. I, I was thinking of of. of Kamala Harris's acceptance speech, uh, actually, her victory speech, you know, and she said this thing about how, you know, um, one of the things that she felt was incumbent upon her was that while she may be the first woman 
and the first woman, the first black woman to occupy this role as vice president of the United States, that one of the things that was important that she must do would be to make sure that she was not the last to occupy that role. Um, and I, the, the reason I think of that is because I'm, I'm sort of put in mind of when I, I'm put in mind of when we talk about women's freedom, we also talk about the freedom to empower other women. So I'll see sometimes women who have risen to, to a certain amount of prominence. I'm, I'm thinking even of some of the sort of recent Congress people that were elected who are kind of staunchly anti-reproductive rights or et cetera. And one of the things I think about when I think about freedom there is that part of freedom is to be able to extend that freedom to the people who come behind you. But some of what I see in these women that have been elected is that they'll step through the door and then they slam it so nobody else can come through. And that isn't really freedom. Um, so yes, it's changed, but um, not nearly to the extent that it needs to. And there are still a lot of very deep things that linger. Okay, thank you. Um, related to the notion of motherhood, um, what you prescribe as, 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 prescribe as, as, as a mother, mother. Mm. sounds like you know failed mother in the sense of failed by the definition of society. Mm -hmm. What about the relation between the mother and the children? Do the children see their mothers as failed as well, or is there hope? Um, I think both. I think both. I think um, you know Lena and Duchess, for example. Um, that relationship is quite damaged, it's a complicated relationship, um, in part because Duchess, Duchess is a, a retired itinerant blues singer who settles in Bonaparte um, after having met Avo. I mentioned that was uh, Lena's stepfather. And, and then after Avo dies, she kind of takes over the, 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 the care of his land and takes over as a kind of stodian for Bonaparte and its history and this sort of stuff. Um, but she's also a woman from um, a mental illness, which I sort of very purposely don't, don't name. Um, and so her relationship with her daughter is compromised both by the fact of that mental illness and also by the fact that she's just kind of a tough lady who has, who thinks that and believes rightfully so in her internal sort of interior freedoms and in the pursuit of her internal landscape and of her artistry and of the things that she believes in. And I think that she has a tough time and, and to her ex-husband too as well. She's very much in love with Alva. Um, and I think that she has a tough time making space for her daughter inside of that. One of the things that I thought of though re related to this larger question about motherhood is that, you know, the this sort of um, our modern insistence on an absolute nuclear family, I think creates pressures around motherhood that, that, are, that are sort of exponentially um, stronger than they would be perhaps in another context. So what if you were living in a thing where the mother was this sort of you know, more, I don't know, free spirited or whatever kind of term you wanna use, but that there really was a kind of village that helped to kind of raise children and care for children and help children to understand that they are loved. That communities mattered is what I'm trying to say. Um, and that communities were as important as the nuclear unit of the family. Um, in that sense, I think you would end up with a very different set of expectations for motherhood and what it is and how it functions. Given that that is not the case, and I suppose now that I say this, in some ways, I guess my novel is sort of a critique of that model as well. Um, I wasn't thinking of it in that way, but I guess I do to pick um, with that. Um, given that that's not the case, these, these others find themselves in under incredible pressure to fulfill any number of roles that it's quite difficult to fulfill, I think, um, or for one person to fulfill on their own. Their children certainly do suffer from that. You know, this isn't, um, you know, I'm not in any way trying to create a sort of rosy picture wherein, you know, these women go out and do what they want. And then the children are like, I understand mom. You know, they don't, you know, these children are, um, it, it's, 
it's difficult times for them to understand the ways in which their mothers love them. Between Lena and Duchess, I think sometimes for Lena, it's difficult for her to understand that Duchess loved her at all. Um, Toussaint certainly knows that his mother loves him, but she is, she's just a complicated figure and he suffers for it. So I think, yes, that there is certainly hope, um, but I think that, I guess to sort of, I'm a little bit repeating myself, so forgive me, but you know, in a society in which things are set up in a certain way, motherhood is set up in a certain way, femininity and womanhood is set up in a certain way, then to deviate from those paths doesn't just mean that the woman who has deviated from the path suffers, it often means that everybody around her suffers. And that's not just about her failings. And, you know, people have personal failings too. These people are not perfect. You know, Duchess is really, I'm glad she's not my mom. I mean, she's, she's difficult, you know, um, and Lena's not so easy herself. So this isn't to sort of create a utopic picture where these women are perfect. They're not, they're difficult women. At the same time, who and what they are, their, their children suffer more the effects of who and what they are, because there is nothing that is set up in the society in which they live to accommodate these women or to accommodate their needs or the needs of their children. Thank you. Um, I think we're slowly running out of time, but there is one very important question and especially important since your publisher is in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so someone writes, very excited that you have a new novel. When will we be able to read it? <laughs> um, when it's done? <laughs> so it's it's very it's a work in progress and I, I'm not I, I especially because my publisher is in the office I am not going to put a, a date um, I'm 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 working on it and so and I'm getting closer to finish than I was before how's that for a vague answer um, and so we, um, and so you know I mean I hope that within the next year to two years um, it'll be out. I don't mean just that I'll be finished, but that it'll be in the world. Um, but don't hold me to it. Um, yeah, that's the answer. No really pressure. vague. No pressure. <laughs> community here develops already. So we really appreciate you to Berlin at some point. Um, I'm very sorry that we have to end this here um, because we're running out of time, but we will um, perhaps send you uh, the rest of the questions and you can look at them and then perhaps uh, get back to our audience. Um, so thank you. thank you a lot. That was really fascinating. It was a great reading and um, yeah, two years seem to be very long, so quite fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you also for every, uh, to everyone who joined us and you might want to join us um, for our next lecture, which will be on November 24th by our Holzbring Fellow Mosi Secret entitled Visions of Tolerance. The 96th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayana. And I look forward to being on the phone with you soon. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everybody who came. Thank you. <laughs>